It's the Cannon Sports Podcast. On today's episode, we're joined by the first-year head coach of Chaminade College Prep Football, David Machuca. Welcome in, everybody, to the Cannon Sports Podcast, coming to you from the home of the Eagles, Chaminade College Prep. I'm Phil George, and we're joined today by the coach of Chaminade College Prep, the first-year head coach, Coach David Machuca. Coach, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Excited to have you. Guys, if you haven't already, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, and let's go ahead and get into the show. Coach, you want to introduce yourself and let us know your background in football? Yeah, my name is uh, David Machuca. Uh, I've been at Chaminade now nine seasons. Uh, I've had the... Uh, Great honor to work under Coach Croson uh, under those nine years. Um, I actually was gone for a point in time. I was coaching junior college for a while and uh, was fortunate enough to be the head coach at uh, what was Bellarmine Jefferson at the time. Um, so just happy to be back, you know, under Coach Croson the last three and a half seasons and uh, just excited about this upcoming season. And of course, it's impossible to talk about uh, this program without talking about the legacy of Coach Croson, who just retired uh, following last season. You were obviously mm -hmm. named the replacement uh, under Coach Croson's watch. Among several accomplishments, Chaminade won the 2013 Southern Section Championship and state title, respected across Southern California. Talk a little bit about his legacy and what he means to this program. Well, I think, you know, Coach Croson's still a part of this program very much so. I, I talk to him probably two to three times a week. Um, he's been a great mentor since I started coaching with him back in 2009. Uh, um, again, you know, his, uh, you know, <laughs> I make the joke, but it, it, it's a reality. I mean, his shadow is still very much a part of this program. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that we do are built on the foundation of things that he's done, you know, over the last, you know, 10 plus years here uh, at Chaminade. What are some of those things that he did to lay the foundation, which you obviously hope to build upon? Well, I think some of the things that he built on on this foundation is obviously discipline, um, doing things the right way, um, you know, and not cutting corners, making sure that not only are the players accountable, but the coaches are uh, accountable day in and day out. I think he really just sets, you know, the right foundation for a high school student, you know, and, and understanding that this is a foundational level and that, you know, it's, it's much more than just football on Friday night. You're building young men. And that is ultimately our job is to help them become young men. And this is just a stepping stone to where they're going. And obviously so much of his role as a coach and any coach is to build young men both on and off the football field. But what influence did he have on you as a young coach as well? Uh, his work ethic. Uh, he was tireless. I remember, you know, getting emails from him at four o'clock in the morning. And one of the funny things he told me, uh, you know, once, you know, it was pretty much announced, you know, that I was going to become the head coach. He goes, you know, you used to make fun of me sending emails at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, just wait, it's going to happen to you. And uh, the very first morning after I became the head coach, I woke up at, I think it was 4.05 in the morning and I started laughing to myself because I thought of Coach Croson right away at 4.05 in the morning, first day on the job, I'm up. So um, I just, he was just, you know, hardworking, um, but cared about the players and uh, cared about the coaches. And I think that's probably some of the biggest influences, just treating people the right way and making sure that the players know ultimately you care about them. It didn't take very long for Chaminade to announce you as the successor to mm -hmm. Coach Cross, and it seemed to be something that was in the works for a couple of years prior to his departure from the program. How much did it mean to you that instead of a prolonged search where they were searching outside the organization, that the administration had that confidence to pretty much immediately install you into that role? Well, I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I never, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, my work ethic has always been is, you know, when I returned was, Hey, every day go to work, work hard. And, you know, everything will take care of itself. I never thought about, you know, when I become the head coach or will I become the head coach? And, you know, it was just about me doing things the right way. Um, coming prepared, you know, every day to practice, coming prepared on campus, be it subbing or working in the admissions office, just doing things the right way. And I think, you know, the administration turning around and hiring me so quickly and having that discussion, you know, I, it was greatly appreciated, you know, because I didn't want to go through the stress of, you know, the the whole um, interview process and, and all of that. So for them to, you know, turn from, you know, obviously Coach Croson and handing me the program, um, it meant a lot. 
and I, I am indebted to them and I feel like I have to work even harder to make sure I hold the, the uh, program at that level. And just as Coach Croson was respected all across the Southern California football mm-hmm. landscape, I understand that uh, that your hiring was met with uh, some some pretty good fanfare. Talk about some of the reactions to that and some of the people that that you heard from and what they had to say. Well, I, you know, in, in you know, the football community, it's small. It really is a small community, you know, coaches, they, everybody knows each other, parents, they all know each other. So it was, it was really great, you know, to have uh, coaches reach out to me, you know, opponents or coaches that I've coached with and, you know, congratulating me and, and saying, you know, you've worked so hard, you know, I know you'll do a great job and, you know, former players. I think that was really, really cool. Um, Guys that I coached in junior college where I think I had a, you know, a big impact on their futures, you know, moving on, you know, from that junior college level. I, I learned a lot coaching at that level. Uh, it's a thankless job, <laughs> to be honest with you, um, you know, and to have the players that I had, you know, sometimes six months, sometimes 18 months reach out to me and say, coach, we're so happy for you. That was, that was really cool. That was, I, I mean, former players, high school players too was great, but to hear from those guys that you're not with them as long, you know, it's a shorter amount of time. Uh, it, it was great. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, an old principal reached out to me that I was with and said, I knew it would happen. I'm really happy for you. Um, uh, ADs and, and that sort of thing, you know, they reached out and said they were happy for me and congratulated me and know that I'm going to do a good job. And hopefully I, you know, I do, I mean, you know, it's all about hard work and determination and effort and energy. And of course, wasn't just your former players and former colleagues that you mm-hmm. worked with that congratulated mm-hmm. you. Uh, you had the pleasure of being announced as the head coach mm-hmm. by your predecessor, Coach Grossen, in mm-hmm. front of the whole team. And I understand that was a pretty touching moment. Can you take us inside that moment and how that news was received by the current players on the team? Well, yeah. Um, you know, kids are smarter than we think. We we don't give them enough credit. They 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 knew something was going on because they made an announcement. Uh, I think it was December seventh or eighth, whatever day that was. And, um, you know, they said, everybody, you know, go to the Bob Hope's uh, media center. So everybody's like, the season's over. What are we doing? You know? So as we were walking there, I got in the car with coach and, you know, he goes, Hey, look, don't worry about me. You know, it's, it's not about me. It's about you now. And, you know, don't, don't think you have to live up to anything that I've done or anything like that, which it's easy to say it's another thing to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I was announced as a new head coach, the, the players were really excited about it, which obviously made me feel good because you really don't know what the reaction is going to be, you know? So it was, it was, uh, it was exciting to know that they were excited that I was going to be, you know, the next head coach. And a lot of the kids I know, um, you know, not just in the program, but again, working in, in the admissions office, I meet a lot of the families. I meet a lot of the, the kids in the local community. So, you know, there's players, you know, at other schools, you know, that, that I know, and, you know, parents that I know. So, you know, I even had some families that their kids don't even come to school here and they they said they were happy for me. So that's great. It was, it was, yeah, it was a really touchy moment. One of the big benefits, obviously, of keeping it in the family is the continuity that that provides. Hiring somebody who is a longstanding member of the staff allows the program to keep some continuity, both in terms of football philosophy and values. We talked a little bit at the top of the show about some Mm -hmm. of those things that Mm -hmm. Coach Croson did that you really want to model yourself Mm -hmm. uh, after and that really laid the foundation for this program. What are some of uh, the most important things that you want to carry over from the way that he did things and make sure that you keep those alive, either on the field or off the field? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, because there's a lot, you know, over the nine years that, that has been done within this program, but I think just doing things every day, the right way, coming prepared to practice, you know, ultimately you're a teacher, you're an educator when you go out onto that field or you get into that meeting room with those kids and you need to be prepared. Um, the kids know if you're not prepared again, they're smarter than, than we give them credit for. And I just, I, those are the things that I see that coach Croson, he was always prepared. You were not going to out prepare him, you know, out scheme him. And I think a lot of that came from years of experience, of course, but also came from the fact that he just worked very, very hard. You know, he worked really hard. I want our, our team, our program to be known as a program that, you know, win or lose, you know, you're going to know that you have to prepare for the Chaminade Eagles each and every week. Um, and that you're going to have to make sure, you know, that it's not just another game. It's a game that you're going to have to get prepared for. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, just 
off of that, you know, the, you know, besides the day to day interaction, but just again, l- letting the players know that you care about them outside of just football. Now, on the other side of that, obviously you, you are your own man, you are your own coach, and they specifically hired you for a reason. So while there are definitely certain elements of your predecessor that you want to make sure that this program maintains, what do you want to bring to this program that's uniquely yours and maybe represents not necessarily a departure from the way that things are done, but your own personal touch to the program? I I think my own personal touch to the program is probably, you know, not much different than maybe coach was, you know, (laughs) 10, 15 years ago, you know, I think we're going to be a lot more aggressive offensively, defensively. I think there's going to be a lot more flair. I think the kids are going to be allowed to um, openly uh, show their personal personalities. You know what I mean? In a positive way, though, you know, we're not trying to show anybody up. um, But, you know, we do want the kids to be kids. I think, you know, things have changed over time, especially with social media, you know, Instagram and just, you know, kids want to, they want to have fun. And this game was founded, I think, you know, besides, you know, the principles of toughness and grit and all those things, but to allow, allow the kids to have fun. You know, one of the first things that, you know, I was asked by the administration, what's something that I would want, you know, and that was a helmet. It, the helmet to me, you know, it, it doesn't uh, create wins or losses, but the kids wanted it. You know what I mean? And the kids are excited about that. And, you know, just to kind of put my own stamp, on the team, you know, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to be fun to watch. And I I just think that overall, you know, you're a team that you're going to still have to continue to prepare for week in, week in and week out. Well, this is usually the point in the show where we ask about uh, your expectations for the upcoming season from a team standpoint. But as it is your first year, I want to still focus on the personal side and your expectations for yourself uh, in your first year as head coach of this program. Now, obviously, as a longtime member of the staff, you have relationships with the coaches and the players and their families. But now that you've assumed this new position as the head coach, what are some of the biggest adjustments you feel you'll you'll have to make uh, as compared to seasons past? I think the biggest adjustment that I'll have to make, unfortunately, is um, not having the so much day to day interaction with a lot of our parents. You know, I was I was, you know, working in admissions. A lot of times I'm the one that is the point contact for a lot of the parents, you know, and to have that, you know, um, interaction with them because there's just only so much time in the day, you know, and and just to be able to kind of separate myself from being the point person, the communication person with the parents to being the head coach now, um, you know, that's going to be a big adjustment. You know, and and I've I've shared that with the parents, so they they understand that. You know what I mean? Um, but that's probably one of the adjustments that I'm going to have to get used to. Another one, you know, that I've already started to kind of get used to, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, you know, I was a head coach for a year. Is just the um, relationships you build with the players outside of your position group. You know, now that I'm the head coach. It's like, oh, coach is here. And, and, and I, you know, they'd make a left and I'm walking right for them. And I'm like, guys, you know, what's up? Like, I'm still the same person, you know, not so much now, but that's how it was at the beginning. You know, I, I would say I'm a player's coach. So I think they're more, you know, receptive to it now. But that was kind of the the a transition period for them. They're like, OK, well, now he's a head coach. What's going to be different? You know what I mean? And I don't think there's much different, at least from my standpoint, maybe from their standpoint. They're like, well, he's the head coach now, but I'm still the same person. So. I want to talk about that term players coach. A lot of people define that in a lot of different ways. Um, In the macro, it obviously means somebody who has a good relationship with the players and caters to the needs of their players. But how do you define that term and how do you make sure that your players needs are being met and you are building those relationships while still keeping the overall needs of the program and the administration in mind? Well, I think it's, you know, when it comes to a player's coach, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. You know, some people look at it as like you mentioned, you know, well, you know, he knows how to get along or he's friendly with the players. My expectations of players are still very high, but they know that I love them, you know, each and every one of them. Um, And really, for me, it's about building a strong enough relationship, a strong enough bond with the players that they know that I have their best interest at heart. And for them, you know, it's, it's the helmets, you know, it's, it's something as small as that. It's, you know, compression t-shirts, which we didn't have, you know what I mean? To them, that was like earth shattering that we were having these things, which again, are 
not hugely important in the wins and losses, but instead of necessarily saying, hey, you need to work for these things to get these things, I gave it to them and then said, okay, now we need to put in the work necessary to represent those things in the right way. Yeah, it shows you're willing to make the investment in them yes. that, they, that they will continue to build upon later. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, there, there's a, a, a quite a few players. I mean, we, we you know, a couple of years ago, I helped start what we now call is the Academic Resource Program here on campus, um, which is a program that I, I kind of uh, helped uh, catapult. Um, and really, it's to help uh, students, particularly, obviously, in the football program, but students in extracurricular activities who need help academically. And I have a huge passion in that. And the players know that. I mean, every every group of freshmen that come in and transfers that come in, they go into our football mentor program. And in that football mentor program, they have a great check every Friday, 8 a.m. That's when it's due. Um, and that's important to me. You know, so they know it's not just football with me. So the program has a built in mentorship program. Yeah, we do that with the in, incoming freshmen and transfer students. And really for us, it's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on. One of the toughest things for an incoming freshman, you know, the, is the first 10 weeks. They have new teachers, you know, a new way of turning things in, you know, coaches, football games. Um, so for me, it was something that I felt that was a, a necessity for the program to start the kids off right on the right academic foot so that we're not playing from behind, you know, after the season's over, Hey, you know, a kid struggling in math or struggling in English. Like we want to catch those things before they become a problem. Yeah. It's, that's, that's interesting. Obviously very valuable for the mm -hmm. players, but obviously every coach that we speak to on this program really prides themselves on their role as a mentor to, to any student, you know, regardless of their level of need. But I've actually, I actually haven't heard uh, thus far about a program that actually has that element built in to their program. Is that something that you, that you find exists throughout the landscape? Uh, it, I don't. And I know that just hearing from other parents, um, it was a program that actually myself uh, and uh, another former coach when I was at Glendale Community College, we started that program. It's now in existence at uh, Glendale Community College. It's uh, the Center for Academic uh, Excellence. I believe that's what they call it over there. And I basically uh, took that groundwork that we started over there and I just brought it to, you know, here to Chaminade with me. And I just thought it was a necessity, not only for football players, but for all uh, students in extracurricular activities, you know, be it band or, you know, robotics, whatever it is, I think there's a need for it for uh, all students. Well, and so many of these players are not necessarily going to be playing on Saturdays and Sundays after they're, after they're done here. So they need those skills in order to succeed in whatever they do after they leave your program. Well, absolutely. And, um, I think we're fortunate here at Chaminade. Um, you know, we, we have, I would say, you know, probably 25% of our students, um, are in an AP course, you know, on our football program. So they take sec seven academic courses. So, you know, you're going to be challenged academically if you decide to come to Chaminade. So really the academic resource program is really just something to aid in additional, um, you know, tutoring or, you know, uh, the mentorship program from, you know, player to player, you know, and, and it builds family and camaraderie, you know, because again, it's not just about football, you know, we're trying to help these uh, young men, um, you know, once they leave Chaminade and have success, obviously in the classroom at their colleges and, and, and make a positive impact. So as you mentioned earlier in the show, this is not your first time as a head coach. Mm -hmm. You spent the 2012 season as the head coach and actually the athletic director as well mm -hmm. at the Bellarmine Jefferson program. Mm -hmm. Talk about that experience and how that prepared you for hopeful success in your second go around as a head coach this time. <laughs> um, well, I what I found out is as much as I thought I knew, I didn't know <laughs> going into that. And I always re remember that and remember, you know, that whole experience. And I think, you know, every, every year you're going to get a little bit better at things that you do, you know, through experience. And I think just the one thing that I can take away from that is, you know, not to necessarily understand that at the end of the game, the kids are the kids, you know what I mean? And, and to have that relationship with them beyond just the football field. You know, I, I was so caught up, I, you know, I, I was 27 years old, so I was caught up with, I got to win. I, I, you know, if we don't win, it's the end of the world, you know? So I was so narrow minded, focused about winning the game on Friday night that I think I missed a lot of opportunities to create relationships, 
you know, with those players. Now I say that, but I have one of my former players that's actually coming back to help us, you know, this year doing some filming stuff for us on Friday nights. So I must have done some things right because I still, you know, I had quite a few of those guys call me too and are excited about, you know, me becoming the head coach here. That's great. Um, Specifically talking about your role as athletic director with the Bell Jeff program. Actually, mm-hmm. our last guest on the program, Rod Sherman, the head coach down at Orange Lutheran, mm-hmm. uh, during a previous tenure that he had with that program, he held both of those positions simultaneously. So I asked his, I asked him this question. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what added insight did that give you being the athletic director while also serving as the head coach of a program that differed with your counterparts who were strictly coaches? Um, Well, I think one of the things is you have to find balance, you know, because now you're the athletic director. So there's there's a little bit different. You know, it can't all be about football. And you're basically the checks and balances. You have to tell yourself no. You know, where, you know, when in this position, I'm just the head football coach and we have an athletic director, two great athletic directors. um, And they tell me, okay, no, coach, we can't do that or we can do that. So I think understanding that there's going to come a time and place where they say no. You know, fortunately for me, um, it's probably because I'm new. You know, they've been, uh, you know, willing and, you know, saying yes pretty much to everything I've asked for. So I'm grateful for that as well. All right. Now let's get into uh, the specifics of this program here at Chaminade more broadly. Um, For those unfamiliar, let's go ahead and get into a little bit of a primer on the recent history of the football program, whatever you want to say about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll start off by throwing out a couple of numbers, 30 and 22 over the last five seasons since you rejoined the program, a winning record in four of those five seasons and some big wins over some big time SoCal programs during that time. Wins over Oaks Christian, Gardena Serra, Alamany, Notre Dame. Uh, tell our viewers anything that you want uh, them to know about the recent or even uh, or even longer term history of the program and where you see it headed in the next couple of years. Well, I think there's been a long history of, uh, great wins for the program. Um, I'm, I'm just going to talk, you know, back even, you know, one of the games that I really felt kind of put us in the right direction was our very first season here at Chaminade when we played Inglewood in the playoffs. Um, I'll never forget that. We, we went down to Inglewood playing on the grass. It was, it was, I'm pretty sure it was, you know, they might've rained the night before. So it was a slip, a slippery night. And I remember coach Croson, you know, we got ready for this whole other offense that we're, you know, spread offense. And he comes out, he goes, you know, we're just going to run the power pitch tonight, you know? And I was coaching the receivers at the time. And I'm like, Oh man, we're going to run the ball the whole game. Well, we ended up winning the game. And the thing about that night is I think it really put us moving forward, uh, in a, in a, position to continue to grow on our success. I mean, that was a big win, you know, and then the following season, we end up going up to the semifinal to Arroyo Grande, you know, unfortunately losing. Um, And then the following year after that, going up to Arroyo Grande again, and unfortunately losing again, you know, going through that and just going through the preparation for that season and for those playoff runs, you know, I, I have notebooks of stuff that Coach Croson has talked about in meetings and different things. And, you know, I reverted back to some of those things, you know, but there's been, you know, as you mentioned, there's been some big time wins. There was, they've had some big time wins, you know, when I, when I wasn't part of the program, when I was on my own, uh, Pulaski Academy, I think they had a, a crazy comeback win. I think that was in 2013, the, the year they won the state championship, you know, even as uh, early as uh, 2019, you know, we go down to Norco. I don't think anybody gave us a shot. We were the 13 seed. You know, we end up beating them in the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 seconds of that game. You know, then coming back the following week and beating uh, Flo and Upland, you know, in in overtime, you know, 28, 27. So there's a lot of history and a lot of success in this program. And for me, I, I'm, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, I'm, I'm trying to just continue the success that we've had. And I know what it's going to take to continue that success, you know, because of the, the, um, I'm, I've been fortunate again, to be with coach Croson, understand how to prepare for opponents and, you know, understand, you know, where the players are, um, as far as when we need to push them and when we need to, you know, kind of, Hey, we need to, you know, give them some rest and that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm excited about it. You know, we have a challenging, uh, upcoming schedule this season and, uh, I'm just ready to go. Let's get into that 2022 season and talk about some of the players on this roster for the upcoming season, starting off with your quarterback, Javance Tupuata Johnson. 
We're excited about Javance, you know, coming in uh, as a transfer back in January. He's put in a lot of hard work, um, his willingness to learn, you know, a fourth offense. I mean, I think that's really um, has been probably one of the most um, interesting things for him as a player, um, you know. He started at, Al at Alamany, excuse me, and then he was at Notre Dame. So he's, I'm going to be the fourth person, you know, the fourth coach telling him, you know, what play to run. But his willingness to learn is probably the thing that I've been most excited about. Um, and, you know, obviously with, you know, all the offers that he has and he just committed to San Diego State, I think since he's committed to San Diego State, I think the pressure has kind of come off of him. And I think he's been playing better. You know, our last two seven on sevens that uh, we had after he committed, he played really, really well. So well, and I want to say and I want to stop you there. Not only did he commit to San Diego State, he is the highest rated quarterback to ever commit to San Diego State. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's he's a he's a great player. I think he's going to show everyone, you know, what he's about this season. I'm, I'm really excited about him. I've known Javan since he was in eighth grade. I saw him playing Pop Warner. You know, the the ceiling for him, he hasn't hit it. And, and I'm really excited about, you know, where he's going, um, you know, and I know San Diego State's extremely excited about getting him. You know, we uh, we I actually took a group of players down to San Diego State um, and they actually offered him that day. So it was pretty cool. Um, Coach Heck down there, he actually uh, recruited one of our other quarterbacks, Jalen Henderson. So we have a little bit of a relationship there. So it's pretty cool. But yeah, but going back to Japan, I think he's going to have a great season. And uh, I'm just I'm, I'm excited to be able to watch it, to be honest. And he's a guy, obviously, like you said, that you that you saw line up against you playing at Alamany and uh, playing at Sherman Oaks, Notre Dame. I imagine it's a lot uh, nicer having him on on your sideline. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot better having him on in, in a number eight jersey uh, with the Eagles than, you know, across town at, at the other schools. So, yeah, no, um, you know, I, I, I kind of joke with him now that, you know, he he played really well against us this past season when he was at uh, Notre Dame. So, you know, I, I kind of. You know, I told him, I said, hey, man, you didn't have to, you know, play that well. And he started, he laughs about it. But yeah, we're excited. We're excited to have him. Great kid, too. I think that's the most important thing. Great teammate and a, and a, a great kid. I mean, he just, he's eager to learn. And that that's that's exciting when you have a player at his caliber that is still looking to continue to grow and and, and uh, succeed. Well, and his presence on this team really represents um, something that's become very important in today's game of football at both the high school and college levels. And that's winning the transfer game. They've become such an important factor in staying competitive. Uh, what is your philosophy with regard to winning the transfer game, both uh, with regard to using that avenue to fill spots on your roster and also creating opportunities and creating a culture to retain the players that you currently have? Well, I think, you know, the, the transfer game, you know, as you, you uh, mentioned, you know, Parents and, and, and players, they they have the ability to come and go, you know, so, you know, if their needs aren't being met in our program and they think that it's a better fit at another program, you know, they're they're free to go. But it, it goes it goes both ways. And what I mean by that is there's going to be players that want to fill, you know, needs in our program. You know, we're not, you know, out there, you know you know, looking for players to transfer in. I think we, over the past couple of years, you know, we've had transfers come in and they've had success, you know, so I think we've attracted players to want to be a part of our program. And as you mentioned, the success that we've had in our program, I think that really is what, you know, has brought more kids to our program, um, you know, and then just to go off of, you know, what you said about, you know, the, the kids that are in our program, we're always looking to develop players. You know, if you're in our program, we're looking to develop you. And, and as a transfer coming into our program, we believe that's also part of our job is to continue to develop you. So for us, you know, if you're an eagle, you're an eagle and our job is to develop you. So one of the things to that, I would say is, you know, be so good. We can't ignore you. You know, if you're the best player, you're going to play, you know, and that's one of the things that, you know, uh, has been said in our program for a long time since Coach Croson has been here and something that I'm going to continue with, you know, be so good. We can't ignore you. And if you're the best player, you're going to play you regardless of age. If you're a ninth grader and you're better than a junior, you're playing, you know, and that's just the way it is here. I want to spotlight another young player on uh, on your teams, your safety, Marquise Gallegos. And like you said, he is one of those younger players and 
He is very good and he is playing. Let's uh, introduce our, our audience to him. Marquise is, <laughs> uh, he's another player. Again, I've known since, you know, his brother played here, uh, actually. Isaac played here on our 2019 team. Um, so I've known him for quite a while. And Marquise is a phenomenal, not only is he a phenomenal player, but he's a phenomenal leader of our program. Um, you know, from the day he stepped in into our locker room, uh, you know, he just fit right away. I mean, having your brother here the year before and you're coming in right after, you know, I, he felt at home and it felt like he never, you know, Isaac never left to be quite honest with you when he was out on the uh, practice field, you know, the first couple of days, I was like, what's Isaac doing here? You know, but it was actually Marquise, obviously, you know, but their mannerisms that I laugh sometimes, you know, uh, Isaac was here during the summer and just watching them walk it, you know, their brothers. So they're very much, you know, very similar, but Marquise is a tremendous player. Um, you know, his ability, you know, to fly to the ball is like no other. I mean, you know, I, I laugh at practice sometimes, you know, he even knows, you know, he baits us into throwing balls and you think something's going to be open. And then he comes out of nowhere, you know, it looks like Superman in the air and, you know, picks off the ball, you know, so he's, he just brings a lot of energy, um, and a lot of, of enjoyment to the game. He comes in every day with a smile on his face, you know, so that's obviously as a, you know, a coach, you know, you're ha you, it, it makes me rest assured that we're doing the right things. If when the players are coming in and they're smiling and it's going to be a hundred degrees today at practice, you know, you're doing the right things. Well, it's not just in your practices where he's uh, baiting guys into into throwing balls that get picked off. Uh, for those who may not know, talk about that Oaks Christian game last year and what he and what he did during that game. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly what he did. You know, he makes he makes people, you know, quarterbacks think that players are open when they're really not. You know, the the ninety nine yard touchdown or one hundred and one yard touchdown. I don't want to undercut the yardage. Uh, you know, was a great play. But I think the more impressive play was the 70 yard interception, you know, on a bubble screen. You know, we run a lot of bubble screens here. So he was, you know, he's able to see it, you know, pretty much on a daily basis on our own practice field. But the the quickness that he showed to undercut the the uh, the bubble screen was phenomenal. I mean, you know, just to be able to watch him, you know, live do that, you know, I was like. It, it was incredible. I mean, he, that's, that's him. You know, he makes you believe that guys are open when they're really not because he's watching. Yeah. 101 yard interception touchdown and then a 70 yard interception touchdown a couple of quarters later. I mean, there's, there's a reason why he's got offers from nearly half the PAC 12 and Oklahoma and Notre Dame. And he's only a junior. So I'm sure there's going to be even more coming. Yeah. I'm sure there's going to be more coming, you know, and, and the great thing about a, a lot of the universities that have offered him in their high academic schools as well, you know, academics are extremely important to his family and himself. So, you know, to me, that just shows um, how well-rounded he is, you know, as a student athlete here at Chaminade. How involved are you in the college recruitment process, both in your previous uh, position as an assistant coach and now as the head coach? Well, I was uh, I was involved uh, a lot with Coach Croson with the recruitment process. Um, you know, he as the head coach, that's who the college coaches want to talk to. They want to talk to the head coaches. And, and he was involved very much in a lot of those um, conversations. Um, he, I was involved, but not as much as I am now. Um, one of the things that I think is important, you know, for in, in, you know, for our football program, for the program that I'm going to lead is to make sure that our students are going off to college, you know, it be at the division one level, the division two level, division three, you know, or, you know, Ivy League, you know, the, the players come here, they, you know, put in their blood, you know, sweat and tears into our program. And, it, you know, it's my job to then give back. And the way I give back is as much as possible, try to get them a free education. Um, and that's really, you know, when I hit the ground running, that was a big push is to make sure that our students were being seen, our players were being seen, you know, and, and there's a place for everyone, you know, it be it division one or division three or Ivy league. There's a place for everyone. And I want to make sure that our players are being given those opportunities. You know, I went up to a uh, Sacramento state, um, back in June for one of the uh, mega camps that they had. I went out to Redlands for one of the mega camps that they had. I, again, I took a group down to San Diego state university of Washington. So I, again, you know, the, the, amount of time that I put into them academically and make sure that they're doing well academically. I put in the same amount of time, um, with their recruitment. You know, I, I I'm on the phone a lot. I probably bug the coaches, you know what I mean? But I, I, I just continue to sell our players because I believe in them. I know what type of, um, young men they are. I know that they're accountable. I know that they're wherever they go, they're going to be a, um, 
a, a great piece to their program. Well, that's no wonder why uh, so many of them called you to congratulate you when you got the job here. Yeah. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about the Mission League more broadly. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the programs down in Orange County get a lot of attention and for good reason, but there's a lot of talent here in the Mission League. Talk about the level of competition in this league and in the San Fernando Valley more broadly. Well, I think the Mission League, you know, with um, Sierra Canyon obviously coming in the league, it's it's become a tougher league. Um, but, you know, I, I think the Mission League, you know, people have said, oh, well, the Mission League's down. I think the Mission League is just as tough as it's been in many, many years. I mean, Bishop Amat has a ton of talent. Gardena Sarah, a ton of talent. You know, Alamany has talent. You know, Notre Dame is always going to be well coached and has talent. So week in and week out, I think the Mission League and I think the, the league as a whole is going to show everybody. I mean, I believe everybody in the Mission League, if I'm not mistaken, has a um, Trinity League opponent. You know, and I, I'm rooting for him. I hope we all, you know, knock off one of the Trinity League opponents. If not all, I don't know how many opponents, you know, play more than one. I know we play one for sure. And I've looked at some of the schedules. I think, as I mentioned, I think everybody plays a, a Trinity League opponent. And I think we're representing not only our schools, but uh, representing the league. And I just think that our talent level in our league has has increased. You know, I think the depth of the talent has increased, you know, because everybody has, you know, maybe one or two players that are division one players. But I think across the board, I think um, our league has a number of division one players on each team this year. Individual talent also plays a role as well. Uh, the Mission League accounted for 20 all CIF selections in 2021, including one of your own uh, wide receiver, Paul Holyfield. And for our viewers in the San Fernando Valley and the surrounding areas, it really seems that you come down and you watch a game in the Mission League, you're going to see some high quality football with some high quality talent and some players who are going to play in some big games on Saturdays and maybe even Sundays down the line. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned before, everybody in our league has multiple, you know, division one uh, players, you know, be it um, offered or are going to be offered. There's a lot of young talent within, within the league. And I just think that, you know, again, speaks of the depth of our league, you know, as far as talent goes. So any, any given Friday night that, you decide to go to a mission league football game you're going to see someone that's going to play on saturday and you know potentially on sunday shamanon has had a few of those players who have gone on to play on sundays most notable among them uh quarterback ryan griffin tight end logan paulson griffin spent some time with the tampa bay buccaneers in 2019 and logan paulson enjoyed a seven-year nfl career mostly with washington scored seven career touchdowns, just under a thousand receiving yards for his career. Uh, I don't believe you coach those two players specifically, but how much does that NFL legacy mean to you and your program? Well, I, I think it's important. And we've had we've had some other players that have gone into the NFL for a little bit. You know, Brad Kyle was, I think, with the Detroit Lions for a while and the Colts uh, for, for a brief moment. Um, but it, it, it goes to show the players that come into this locker room that they have the opportunity um, to possibly uh, possibly play on Sundays. Um, you know, it's, you know, the chances, you know, the, they talk about, you know, the pyramid, you know, as you rise, it gets smaller and smaller, but you can come to Chaminade, get a great education and have the potential to play in the NFL one day. I wanted to talk about Brad Kaya specifically, uh, six round pick of the Lions in 2017 out of the University of Miami. And even though he never got into an NFL game, like you said, he did spend some time on the practice squad and in the offseason with, with a handful of NFL teams. But possibly more impressively is what he did at Miami. He's the all time leader in passing yards and a lot of other passing statistics at Miami. And that's a program that boasted quarterbacks like Jim Kelly. Vinny Testaverde, and statistically in several respects, Brad has all of them beat. Um, you know, you didn't coach him specifically, but how impressive of a player was he? Uh, Brad Kyle was uh, a, a great talent. Uh, I was fortunate uh, to watch him actually one game. Uh, it was the heart game in this it wasn't the cif championship it was in the regular season it was uh, 65 to 67 it was a crazy i remember it was scoring back and forth that night but his ability 
um, to just navigate the offense, knowing, you know, what the offense is and being able to sit in the stands and watch as a fan. It was impressive. And then when he got to Miami and, you know, he just really hit the ground running, you know, to watch him on Saturdays and just watch, you know, his ability to go through progressions and get the ball out on time was, you know, it was it, it was it was impressive to watch, you know, and the few times that I got to talk to him, you know, great young man. Um, you know, he came back uh, when Coach Croson uh, retired and, and actually spoke about him at our uh, banquet and just, you know, he's an eagle. I mean, he definitely he, he, he loves Chaminade. You know, he talked about his time at Chaminade and obviously under Coach Croson. But, you know, on the field, you know, it was very impressive. And obviously he holds those records, you know, and the names that you mentioned, those just aren't anybody. Those are big time, you know, players that went through the University of Miami. Yeah, so with some of those players we talked about, like Ryan Griffin, like Logan Paulson, like Brad Kaya, and like some of the current players that uh, have big-time offers from big-time programs uh, on this year's roster, what do you want to say about Shamanad's place in the football landscape as a home for players looking to make that jump to the next level? Well, I think if you're looking for to be challenged academically first, and you're looking to be challenged on the football field, then this is the right fit for you. I think that you have to be willing to do both. Um, you have to be willing to do it in the classroom and you're going to have to be willing to put forth the work uh, on the field. You know, this is a college prep school. So we want to make everything college prep about your experience here from the classroom to the field, to the weight room, you know, to talk about, you know, nutrition, you know, our athletic uh, training facility. Um, we just want everything college prep in, in your, you know, eight to five, you know, you, you school starts at eight 30 in the morning, by the when, when you leave here, you know, I got a college prep experience from the start to finish here. And that's, you know, if you're looking for that challenge and this is the right place for you when it comes to the college landscape and looking, you know, to go on to the next level, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and a lot that goes into it is the development that you're going to get within our program. You know, you have a lot of coaches that have been here. Our associate head coach has been here for 10 years. Um, you know, our offensive line coach has been here, you know, for quite a while, you know, it's just, it's a program that has a solid foundation which I think is the most important um, part of the program is making sure that you're not, you don't have a bunch of turnover within the coaching staff, which we don't. And I think that that will get you prepared for the next level. So, you know, if you're looking for the, a program to do those things, Shamanad's the place for you. I think that's a great message and a great place for us to leave it today. Coach Machuca, I want to thank you for joining us on the Cannon Sports Podcast and want to wish you the best of luck in your first season as the head coach of the Eagles program. Thank you. And that's going to do it for us today. Please, again, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Once again, thank you for Coach David Machuca for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Cannon Sports Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and follow on Instagram at Canon Sports, TikTok at Canon Sports Official, and of course, canonsports.com for all your sporting goods needs.